step index and uh, we begin with the first topic for today in which we start with a class one the anatomy of the appendix followed by the appendix then to be discussed with the surgery or clinical presentation of a patient with an acute appendicitis now when you start with the appendix anatomy now appendix is such a common thing that more or less every one every student more or less has a good knowledge about the anatomy of the appendix and We have now strongly questioned this belief whether this is at all a vestigial organ or not. Now, when you talk about an appendix, it has two more important function. One is something called as the immunological function, which talks about the role of appendix in use of T cells, which are responsible for non-specific immunity in the intestine. Whereas there is another school which says that yes. there is also a group of b cells which are responsible for secretion of immunoglobulins and the immunoglobulins are responsible for gut associated mucosal tissues and this one are responsible for local secretion of immunoglobulin e which are responsible particularly against viral agents and against a few bacterial agents more predominantly viral agents so it is not exactly that it is not those who say that they has an immunological problem then they will also say that that there is another role of something called as a probiotics and what is important is when you talk about this probiotic story uh, there is an important role about use of bacterial maturation i use the word in inverted commas and in which it is bowel friendly bacteria which are seen in this one and this helps in fermentation of fat in the cecum so that means it is not that the removal of the appendix produces a problem what is interesting is that that people have seen that uh, that if you talk about ulcerative colitis and an acute appendicitis it is seen that those who have an ulcerative colitis have a lesser chance of an appendicitis epidemiologists have argued this in casual observation whereas incidence of crohn's disease increases probably suggesting that immunology has a lot of things to note about in an appendix so appendix is not to be considered to be an vestigial organ it is an old concept we consider the main job to be immunological in which as i've said it talks about local immunity earlier people used to call it as an abdominal tonsil things have changed a lot in which we have understood the immunoglobulin synthesis and the t cell function of the appendix now so this is the first part of the story what is the job of the appendix the human appendix has a variable length but uh, on an average it can start from 2 cm people have argued around 20 cm with average length being around 10 cm and as you can see with the picture everyone knows about this picture arises usually from the convergence of the three tinea coli at the base of the cecum so what is important is that that this blind tube like structure which is a very important thing for an ultrasound to identify is important because that the blind tube is seen by the convergence of the three tinea coli now when you talk about this next one this one is the appendix and as you can see the appendix is laden by a mesentery which always contains the appendicular artery and as we shall talk about this in this picture so the appendix contains the appendicular artery and the appendicular artery sends of multiple branches to this we'll talk about this now so when you talk about the appendicular artery as you can see in this picture appendix is a direct branch of something of uh, the ileocolic or the ileocecal artery now this is a picture from the crease anatomy what we have understood is that that the superior mesenteric artery so if i can erase this one it will be easier i think yes just let me go to the layout of this one 
right now so it becomes easier for me to draw pictures now now sorry yeah so it, now we have talked about the iliopolic artery now see this so if you talk about the superior and mesenteric artery the superior mesenteric artery continues to become the iliopolic artery the iliopolic artery usually continues to have an ileal branch and a colic branch and the colic branch will have an ascending branch which will supply the cecum and the colon and a descending branch which is going to supply the cecum again and this descending branch gives of a branch to the appendix and continues as the appendicular artery now this descending branch which supplies the cecum also gives of another artery called as an accessory appendicular artery so that means the picture of concern that becomes is that if this is the appendicular artery so if i can take this marker pen give me a minute guys yeah i think it will be easy now this is the iliopolic artery now with this iliopolic artery just wait yeah so this is the iliopolic artery now with this iliopolic artery as i have said if you have this cecal artery the cecal artery will be supplying this and the iliopolic artery will be going and supplying more or the less majority of the appendix but the cecal artery can also provide something called as an accessory appendicular which can supply the base of the appendix as well so the accessory appendicular and the appendicular artery are done in majority of the cases if this is the appendix then always remember that the appendicular artery for all practical purposes is considered to be an end artery that means you occlude the artery the rest of the appendix more or the less is guaranteed to die out except maybe near the base of the appendix the accessory appendicular arising sometimes from the iliopolic or the cecal artery is usually responsible for keeping this area very prominent but it is not that that perforations don't occur at the base they can always do so this completes the first part of your topic about the arterial supply which is a very common question in an mbbs this examination what is the blood supply of the appendix and appendicular artery why is it an end artery what is the consequence as i have said ligation of the appendicular artery or occlusion of the appendicular artery is responsible for causing and gangrene of the appendix now let us talk about before we conclude the anatomy thing is about what is the importance of position of the appendix now it is better to talk about position of the appendix in relation with a clock now this is the 12 o'clock Six o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock. So, for example, you are talking about a four o'clock. So, this is exactly the location of this. So, what I will do for you guys is that that I will erase these arms and I will use two color pens to distinguish between these two arms. So, what I will do is that I will uh, take this pen and I will take this one. So, this is the minute arm and I will take this pen, another one. I will take this one. this is the hour sum so i will do this one so that it becomes easier for me to draw the picture now so if this is the clocks what are the positions of the appendix the first position of the appendix the first position of the appendix to draw out is something called as the retrocecal position please understand this one what is a retrocecal appendix the retrocecal appendix as you can see in this picture will take a position between as i've said between our so if this one is the cecum then this color is the appendix so what is this position about so this is the appendix arm so let me draw the picture once again guys cecum arm and this one is called as the appendix arm so this is this please appreciate this picture something called as a retrocecal appendix which is seen in 74% of people as far as very love so these are pictures from very love that i took so that i can teach in this and is the most common location now what is the anatomical importance of this the only anatomical importance is that the patient presents with a back pain and along with a back pain excuse me for a minute on this one right so the patient presents with a back pain and along with this you get a flexor spasm of the psoas and you get a copes swas test which is positive for this that means on extension the patient gets a pain now the differential diagnosis sometimes becomes an ureteric colic 
sometimes becomes a radiculopathy but what is important is that this is the most common one it becomes difficult for you to distinguish it on an ultrasound ct scan is a much better one to locate the location now perforations of this can again happen in the peritoneal cavity can happen in the retroperitoneal cavity so please remember that retrocecal is also combined with another position called as paracecal which is more or the less the same picture as that one so what is important is that that this is behind the appendix this is sometimes extra peritoneal in location because as i have said the cecum is peritoneal so if it has to go behind the cecum it has to be extra peritoneal in location so these are the points to remember now let us talk about the second group of problems now when we talk about the second group the second type of appendix that is the next common one is something called as the pelvic group of appendicitis so we talk about this group called as an pelvic appendicitis now when you talk about an pelvic appendicitis i have shaded the pelvic appendix for you guys so that you can have and look into this now when i draw about something called as the pelvic appendix again let me draw the clock for you again let me draw the cecum one for you and let me draw the appendix one so how much does it resemble it is technically a 5 o'clock or a 4 o'clock now what are the important things now remember that this is going to touch now this is going to touch either the fallopian tubes or it touches into the ureter or remember so it can touch into the fallopian tube it can touch into the ureter it can touch into the uterus it can touch into the urinary bladder and irritation of this may produce a vague symptom but usually what is important is that that this patient will present with a pain in the lower abdomen sometimes even also if it irritates a supra pubic pain what makes in pelvic appendix also important is the chance that it can perforate freely in the peritoneal cavity if it does not form a lump so what is the next thing that we learned about so as i have said the most common location is retrocecal second most common location is a pelvic perforation can happen if it is not localized by a lump is the second thing that you need to know the rest of the locations of appendix are not important for everyone to remember for the exam but you should particularly if you are trying for a mcq examination the next common location is something called subsecal and as you can locate this one this is in touch with a muscle called as the obturator internus so if it touches the obturator internus so the subsecal position some people call it the pelvic also touches it can lead to flexure of the obturator internus and this is seen by the copes obturator test in which the flexion of the hip the internal rotation of the hip will produce a severe pelvic type of pain so this one is thus called as a copes obturator test so the third thing that you are required to know is a subsecal in location now there are last of the two remain something called as a pre ileal and a post ileal so what are these ones just have a note a pre ileal and a post ileal now when we talk about a pre and a post ileal let us again draw our clock and then let us talk about uh, what will be your status of this one so that means this is the cecal arm and this is the appendix arm so 2 o'clock now what is important is that that as you can see what intervenes in between is the ileum now what is in front and what is behind this is the location of the appendix so what is important for you to remember in this one is that uh, in a pre ileal and a post ileal what becomes important in this one is that the ileum is something that is getting compressed by the appendix on two sides so this patient will typically present with a diarrhea number 2 the patient presents with a vague pain abdomen particularly around the umbilicus and again if it does not form a lump perforation may happen so let us talk about so these are the things that you are required to know in an appendix anatomy so let us recap we have talked about the arterial supply of the appendix that it is an end artery derived from the iliopolic artery we have talked about the various positions of the appendix 
and then so you are now in an appropriate state now before we go to the artery and the vein and the pathology just a few words to talk about the appendix if i have talked about the vein and the arteries then it is also important for us to know about what is the venous drainage now in the venous drainage part what is important is that the venous drainage of the appendix goes exclusively to the portal vein and when it goes to the portal vein remember definitely it has to go to the liver now in the liver an acute appendicitis is responsible thus for forming a pyogenic liver abscess some people older guys will not call it as pyogenic liver abscess they will call it as portal pyemia not exactly the same words but still you are required to remember that one among the causes of a pyogenic liver abscess not a common one is an appendicitis on the right and a diverticulosis on the left so final word before we end up this one is remember that the meso appendix in this one the picture that i drew now as i have said that that uh, this contains a lot of so this is the meso appendix that i'm sharing for you so if this is the meso appendix this meso appendix contains multiple lymph nodes and it is said that around there is a lymph node collection of 4 to 6 which will follow this one go to the ileocolic mesentery and as i can show you in this picture so in this ileocolic mesentery there are multiple lymph node and the importance only lies if you have a carcinoid tumor in the appendix the minute you have a carcinoid what happens is carcinoids more than 1 cm diameter have a chance to metastasize carcinoids more than 2 cm have a metastatic rate of around 80 to 90% hence for this reason any carcinoid that is greater than 2 cm is treated by a right hemicolectomy whereas any carcinoid less than 1 cm it is treated only by an appendicectomy alone so what will you do for carcinoids between 1 to 2 cm carcinoids between 1 to 2 cm will only have a right hemicol if a b c number 1 there are involved lymph nodes in the ileocolic mesentery that means you have lymph nodes in this area point number 2 it is near the base of the appendix that means the tumor is down in this place number 3 the tumor has crossed the serosa and is infiltrating into the meso appendix so these are the points to be remembered in this one a b and c so we have discussed about a b and c so these are the findings to be known about in this one right in call so these are the things that we talk about in the anatomy of this one so let us quickly go through the pathology of the appendix just allow me to uh, take up the next one no when you talk about so we have talked about the appendix pathology so now uh, just give me a minute to talk about after we have discussed about uh, what is what about after we have discussed about uh, what is what about all of these so now let us make around our way for the pathology of the appendix just give me a second yeah right <coughs> now <coughs> so now so let us talk about the pathology of the appendix and uh, let us have this one now when you talk about the pathology of an appendicitis as i have said the appendix is basically a test tube like structure and the mouth of the test tube is opening in the cecum so whenever you have anything that blocks the mouth then does the lumen gets blocked but before we talk about the rest of the knowledge it is important to know about what are the layers of the appendix the appendix as you know contains four layers the first layer of the appendix is something called as the first layer of the appendix is something called as the mucosa 
and uh, the mucosa of the appendix the mucosa is a first layer now when you talk about the mucosa of the appendix contains goblet cells and these goblet cells are responsible for secreting a lot of mucin so the first layer of concern is something called as a goblet cell enriched mucosa and this mucosa is also known to contain a lot of uh, chromaffin cells from which definitely carcinoid also i'm sorry for the spelling oh, no so it contains a lot of chromaffin cells which are responsible for carcinoid tumors so the first layer now the next thing that is mucosa contains are t lymphocytes which are not very conspicuous on a normal histology but become important when you are talking about the pathology the next layer of concern is something called as a submucosa which is more or less a very prominent layer that is seen and this layer will usually as you know contain a collection of lymphocytes again which are said to be again t lymphocytes then i should make it along with a b lymphocytes to talk about in this layer now these layers are technically responsible for the innate immunity in the patient the next layer of concern is something called as the muscle layer and as we shall see so if this is the serosa and sorry this is the muscle layer so this is how the muscle layer looks like around the appendix i draw a very simplistic diagram to make you understand how does this thing look like on this one and at the end of the day as you can see nothing the muscle is not that great what is important in this muscle is the muscle is a conglomeration and is usually only longitudinal muscles are very scarce what is important is you get a lot of circular muscles which are seen the last one is the serosa of the appendix which is more or less a peritoneal covered layer and across the peritoneal covered layer as you will see one side contains the meso appendix and in this meso appendix you will find the appendicular artery which as i have said is an end artery so this is an appendicular artery branch so this is how about the pathology that is the beginning part of the story so now if you have known about the pathology the rest of the thing is a little of clinical correlation with the pathology that you should note about in an appendicitis now what is the important thing in etiology of appendicitis of all the things please keep this test tube like story in mind appendicitis pathology can usually be divided into the etiology is usually divided into a obstructive pathology and a non obstructive now this is what the old belly laugh mentioned around a lot of years ago now we have changed this once and we can call it as a fixed obstruction we can now call it as a fixed obstruction example being a fecolith that means something in the lumen okay or it can be something in the wall it can be something in the uh, luminal cause which is not a rare common one now if you talk about the wall the wall of the appendix can have lymphoid hyperplasia i have told you about the normal picture of the appendix and this is how the lymphoid hyperplasia in the appendix will look like just give me a second yeah so what i will do is that i will draw the picture for you so this is the appendix the lymphoid hyperplasia looks somewhat like this to block the lumen so this is the lymphoid hyperplasia and hence it is no wonder that adolescents are known to have an appendicitis now talking about luminal blocks the most common luminal block is a fecolith or a foreign body that is ingested which is rare but this one is the most common one talking about luminal blocks again luminal blocks in tropical countries like india you get round worms very commonly which will block the lumen and then you get other organisms like small 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 organisms and these small small organisms remember are a bunch of something called as enterobias verbicularis or pin worm whereas it can also be whip worm sorry trichuris 
trichura so what is it called as it is called as whip one so what are the two things enterobias whip worm trichuris round worm sometimes most common always being fecolith foreign body not facebook now lymphoid is seen in adolescence so what is important is the appendix lumen needs to be blocked to produce the story about this one now after this is done the rest of the job becomes pretty simple and as you can see the rest of the thing will be very straightforward now the minute it is blocked the mucin secretion will always continue because as i've said the mucosa contains a rich collection of goblet cells now when it is blocked so the so the luminal block which is a basic event in everything is going to produce an increased accumulation of mucin and now the increased accumulation of mucin will produce a distension the distension that is produced we'll use another ink in this one just give me a second please yeah now the distension so the clinical correlation of this phase is now the appearance of non specific peri umbilical pain why does it happen we'll talk about that in the clinical part but remember that pain starts happening into this and pain is usually the more is the distension or the distension if it is increased then you get a problem of nausea and vomiting so appreciate that pain started first and then the nausea vomiting the more is the distension what happens is the mucosal blood flow decreases the mucosal blood flow decreases means there is a bacterial translocation and what kind of bacteria usually anaerobic bacteria like bacteroides okay and enterococci are required to be understood so there is a bacterial translocation and the bacterial translocation will now lead rise to an acute appendicitis now the minute it occurs with an acute appendicitis there is in the clinical part a reflex remember so the whole appendix now will look like so if this is the whole appendix tube the whole appendix now takes an angry look and the whole appendix becomes red in color because it has now been inflamed by the translocation of the bacteria and an acute appendicitis usually starts now when we talk about the clinical point the inflamed appendix as i have said the inflamed appendix is now responsible for touching the parietal peritoneum so now the patient will have a pain which as you can see will now travel not at the umbilicus but at the right lower quadrant so the pain started at the umbilicus now the pain is at the right lower quadrant and you have a classical appendicitis now more is this one so more is this problem going to persist with the mucosal ischemia so the more is the mucosal ischemia increased uh, not the mucosal ischemia sorry more is the ischemia due to the increased pressure in the lumen that will lead rise to a gangrene of the appendix gangrene will lead rise to an perforation of the appendix so this is all about things that we will talk about that in the pathology so this is all about the pathology of an acute appendicitis in the clinical class when you have that we will again bring in the pathology and then we will again discuss about each of them and what is the pathological manifestations that you should note as a clinician so with this the first part of the appendix class is at an end thank you everyone so let us join for the clinical class after the break